it's without doubt for me the one area of matchmaking that needs improving. The way our rigs are, I think they're very, very poor. If I'm completely honest, match anglers' lack of knowledge when it comes to carp fishing. Right, so the first time out this year filming with the Matrix cameras and it's still winter, it's still cold, it's still horrible, but we've still got a job to do. So we thought it'd be a really good opportunity, especially with the mild weather that we've had of late since, uh, pretty much since the Christmas period. It's been nice, wet, windy, but quite mild. It'd be a really, really good opportunity to come out and do some carp ledgering. I mean, it's something that we've not focused on really, really, really in depth before. And I thought, say, we come out today, we'll fish for some proper carp. That's definitely the emphasis is going to be um, wintertime ledgering for proper carp, for commons and mirrors, not so much F1s because that's a whole different video in itself. But it just has to be a great thing to go through the many, many different things that would be nice and applicable, of course, for the wintertime. But also when it comes to ledgering for carp, say, it's a nice way that you can take things on to the summer. I mean, it doesn't pretty much change other than feed gets introduced and you start putting a bit of bait in. This time of year, feed is pretty much a no-no, but I'll come on to that in a minute. So yeah, that's what today's gonna to be all about, is, if I'm completely honest, match anglers' lack of knowledge when it comes to carp fishing, or fishing for big carp without feeding. The way our rigs are, I think they're very, very poor. Even at the, the level we're at now, we're a million, million miles behind carp anglers, and I think it just needs anglers to think about things a little bit more, make our rigs a little bit better, make ourselves more efficient, and that's what this video is going to be all about. So straight into it, I'm going to go very, very technical and riggy with you, talk about why I'm doing things, making sure I don't miss them opportunities. So yeah, that's what today's going to be all about, ledgering, advanced ledgering for them big wobbly ones during the winter. So to start off, it'd be definitely fitting, I suppose, to start off with bomb and bread. You know what I mean? It's what 99% of us, it's our go-to thing. When we want to fish for a carp, first chucker early on in a ledgering carpy session, bomb and bread is definitely the, it's the thing we most have confidence in, I suppose, and it's probably what we catch the most fish on. And that's definitely what, I, what I'll talk about first. But the main thing, before I go into um, leads and rigs and hook lines and all that sort of thing, I just want to focus on what you're trying to actually achieve when it comes to fishing bomb and bread. I mean, people assume that you put bread on, it pops up like a cork, and that's the right way of fishing it. It is definitely not. And you have to, I'm not gonna say maintain an understanding, you have to know by testing things, having a look in the water to see what's going on with your actual rig, to have an understanding of what it's doing. Bread can be a right tricky bait, and it's quite inconsistent in the way you prepare it. Different breads and all that behave in different ways when you put them on different hairs, different hooks, a million different variables that control what they do. So what I want to do is keep things really, really simple and explain the basics in getting your bread to, or getting the required presentation that you're trying to achieve when you're fishing bread. Because there's pretty much only two ways of doing it that you're looking at. What you want, in my opinion, is either a bread that works like a, a carp angler sort of wafter thing, where you've got your hook lying on the bottom, you know I mean, a decent weight of hook lying on the bottom, and the bread's just wafted above it, I mean, so you, it's anchored to the bottom sort of thing, but working as a, pretty much working as a wafter, a lovely pop-up thing, or you want it in, what are you gonna call it? I'm gonna go quite carpy and say like zig form, where you do want it suspended really, really tight on a straight hook length at whatever depth you may think they can't, might be swimming. And it's definitely the two ways you wanna fish it. Any other way, if you wanna fish it static, on bottom, potentially feeding, then use other baits. That's what I'm gonna go into second, is the swap into baits like corn maggots, whatever your preferred carp bait is, that's my second step. But first, I wanna talk about my two bread rigs. Definitely two different ways of doing things that achieve what I want with my bread to do. I mean, I understand that when I throw it out there, I'm not assuming that my bread's popping up, sitting down, I wanna know exactly what's happening. I'm gonna talk about the little variables that do exactly that for me. So, what I'm gonna start with. Should we start with the ultimate popped up one? Let's go with the silly one first. Let's go with the, the zig rig form, which I'd say is probably the most popular way of fishing. And what you've got to look at is you're trying to create a, a bait that it wants to float pretty much. Yeah, but you've still got the anchorage of your lead to keep it where you want. So what the most important thing is, is that your um, hook bait is going to overpower the weight of the hook. I mean, you need the first choice that you are gonna have to make is by using a slightly smaller or for me, a lighter gauged hook or even both in some situations 
that isn't going to have them anchorage properties that a big lump of metal would have. I mean, you physically want it to pop up without going silly with too many um, buoyancy aids added to your bread to do so. And what I will definitely focus on is that bread on its own is, for me, it's too hard to um, maintain a consistent um, result, if you like, with my rig. So I need other things involved to make it doing. And what I do to do exactly that, let me get that rod out way, is that with it, I'm a big, big fan. I have been for flipping 15 years. I've been a big fan of using little tiny six mil white boilies, pop-up boilies that are like flipping corks when you throw them in. And they're for me what um, create the pop-up effect. You know what I mean? The bread in itself, as I keep saying, far too inconsistent in getting its approach. So by using my hook bait in this case, what I've got is a really nice simple hair with a quick stop on, a fairly light gauge wire hook. That's one of our prototypes in a 14. So still a decent size, but a, not a light wire, a medium gauge wire. I mean, not got too much weight to anchor that bait on the bottom, but you can see there, I've got that lovely little half boilie. Well, that's probably two thirds, if anything, that is a really popular one that goes on it first. That goes the first thing I put on my hair with the round side towards the hook. So it creates a nice flat plate there for all my bread to go against. So you can see my three, four, five, six pieces, whatever, however, however much bread I want to put on, goes above that and it just sits there lovely. And if I plop them in the water, I can guarantee that from my lead, I mean, I'm not going to talk about leads and rigs yet. I'm going to come into that once I've talked about popping it up. That's going to sit vertically off my lead, keep things really, really tight. If I plop that in, hopefully we'll be able to see that doing a lovely job of working pretty much like a cork. And you can see, even in the edge, just like that, it is sat really vertical, tight off the bottom. It's doing what I want it to do. And then obviously the length of my hook length dictates what that bread does. But so that's what you want to be doing as well, is putting it in the edge and having a look. Don't ever, ever, ever assume. I mean, whether it's the edge, a bucket, whatever else, so you can know, just as you'll do meth feeder fishing, put your rig in, see what it's doing and go from there. So that's me popped up one. Next up is me, me clevery wafter it one. Like I said, when I first, with the intro that we did on this, the thing that I mentioned was we're crap at legend for carp pretty much. We're not very good at all when it comes to match anglers. So what we need to do is think more about how carp anglers do things and, and do you mean copy it, rip them off, because they have a much more efficient way of hooking carp, presenting the bait than we do. And this is the biggest um, discipline of our sport, if you like, that needs improvement as far as I'm concerned. So next up, so we're on to the waftery one. I'd say all lead, same again, not going to babble about them. And it is no different other than I've got a great big lump of uh, metal on. I've got a much, much, much bigger hook on that one. Yeah, in that case, I've got a big L size 12, a heavy gauge wire. Again, that's one of our new ones. Forget about how it's tied and all that sort of thing. That's irrelevant. But with this one, I just have a tiny little piece of boiling. Yeah, exactly the same as I've put on that. I've put a half on to begin with, and I physically trim some off with my scissors until I get that perfect presentation, where I know that without putting the bread on, just with my boiling on, lovely, I know that it's just sitting nice. And then the bread being, in most situations, a neutral buoyancy sort of bait, you can get it to do what you want really, really easily. Um, as long as it's not compressed, which I'll come on to in a minute with the punches, I know that if I drop that in, it should be that my hook's still gonna lie on the bottom. It's gonna wanna sink, but at the same time, it keeps everything where I want it, but my bread's that, that, that wafter element -y type thing. So hopefully he's gonna sink a little bit better and he's gonna work out lovely. So that's what we want to try next is keeping that bait on the bottom completely different form of presentation so what i'm achieving with the popped up one but it just depends what them carp want to do i mean you've got to remember at this time of year we're fishing for carp that they don't want to eat i mean often i'd say 95 percent of the fish in the lake are dormant and you can't catch so what you're after is that five to ten percent of the lethargic ones that are just swimming about and say there might be days when they're swimming off the bottom they do not go down and pick it up and you want to use a zig tight rig popped up off the bottom to grab their attention. Other days it'll be a little bit warmer. They might want to pick a little item up off the bottom. That's something I'm going to use this, where I don't want that um, blatant sort of zig rig approach right in front of those really, really weary, moody, not wanting to feed carp. That's when I'm going to swap to this. This in fact will probably be my go-to before I swap to the zig rig, but it gives me an option of two different forms of presenting my bread to give myself the best chance of catching these moody things that's going to be an utter nightmare to catch once it goes cold and they stop feeding. So with the popped up bit hopefully made a little bit easier, a bit more straightforward to achieve what you're trying to do, next I want to move on to the 
probably the most important bit and that is the rigs and how am I going to focus on this? The biggest fault, without a doubt, when it comes to match fishing, the way that we present our rigs on a bomb, summer, winter, whenever, is the fact that the horrible, and without doubt, we get what the carp anglers call it, done. Definitely, definitely, without a doubt, them fish pick our bait up and don't hook themselves, give you a bite, whatever, millions and millions of times. I think if we could actually see what was going on underwater on many occasions, we'd quit fishing, because it'll be horrendous the amount of times they're picking your bait up and they're getting away with it, which, we don't want to happen. I mean, we want as many things in our favour as possible, especially on these winter days now when I'm looking at, it could be a handful of bites you're looking at catching. The last thing I want to do is get that bite, not see it, the fish get away with it, I don't catch that fish, which I mean, it's not what it's about. I want to feel that at least I'm giving myself the best chances possible um, at every fish hooking itself, which is what it's all about when it comes to ledgering. What we're going to do first? Yeah, bombs. So that, that's the first thing we'll talk about is bombs. The, the weight of the bomb that you're using Obviously, you've got the issue of being dictated to by the fishery whether you're allowed uh, fixed leads or free running. I mean, if you're allowed fixed leads or semi-fixed, my advice would be use them 100% of the time if you're allowed. Without doubt, they create, whether they create a bolt effect or whatever, but they create an annoyance to the fish. They just help in whatever percentage it may be, put that hook into the fish's mouth that any help for me is a benefit. So if you can use a fixed bomb, great. 90% of fisheries, however, they need to be free running, which is what, to be honest, it tends to be what we have to use. I mean, it's sort of what you get used to using because nearly every fishery makes you do it anyway. So for me, free running, semi-fixed, whatever you want to call them, there's, there's ways of doing things still to make sure that them fish are putting the hook into the mouth or you can help to achieve that. Be it either tightening really tight up to the tip, that can be a nice little thing that you can do. If the fish let you do that, you're not upsetting the fish in your peg by really bending into it, that can help hook the fish. But also using much, much heavier bombs than you'd necessarily need to get to where you're casting to, again, it can be a, a benefit to self-hooking. Definitely, definitely worth trying if you can get away with it. But what it comes to, when it comes to choice of bombs, for me, the conditions, if anything, probably the conditions and the way that I'm fishing, they're the two elements that I'm going to look at that are going to influence the size of bomb that I use. So if it's really, really flat, calm, crispy, lovely, lovely winter's day, the last thing I want to do is crash a big bomb into the lake, probably upset them fish, send them out my area, I'm not going to catch them as a result. So getting the bite is the first important bit. So that will dictate to me how heavy a bomb I use for the subtlety I need to get into it. So if it's nice and calm, I'll probably swap to a, a 10 gram, the finesse leads that we're calling, the finesse pilot bombs, i probably use that sort of thing, which if anything, probably doesn't they benefit myself hooking properties, but it gives me the chance of getting that bite in the first place. However, in today's case, which is what I'd much rather be fishing in when it's nice and windy, that I can step up to much, much, much larger bombs. 20 gram up to flipping, massive, great big thing, 70 odd grams if needed, just to help get that hook into the fish's mouth. So the last thing I want is the fish to pick it up and spit it because my lead's not heavy enough. So for me, using nice, big, heavy, small inline leads as well, so coming from the carpy background of things, so them fish are, are picking up the weight of the lead as quickly as possible, so there's no dangly swivels and all that sort of thing going on. Definitely, definitely a big advantage when it comes to putting them uh, hook into the fish's mouth. So lead's done, as I said, for me, fixed leads, semi-fixed sort of leads, inline leads, I suppose, is the, the way of going with it. Definitely my choice when doing this during the winter months, but then it's moving on to the hook length. So the next thing when them fish are gonna pick up the hook Again, you're often dictated, dictated to by the fisheries in the length of hook length you're allowed. But for me, I want a, a stiff as possible hook length without being stupidly tight. I mean, what, what's the word? Taut, not tight, is really, really important again. Because if you have a really, really loose hook length, um, what you tend to find is the fish have got that allowance to suck it in, spit it out, and they've never actually came in contact with the lead itself. So by using slightly longer hook lengths, like maybe in this case, I've probably got a 12 inch on, but you find it's really, really stiff. In this case, it's 022 fluorocarbon, but you can see with it, the top, what we're gonna to say, top quarter of my hook length has all been twizzled to create a boom. So because of the thickness of the, the line itself, plus that little boom, you find that when my rig goes into the water, I'm not getting that bunched up effect that you get if you're fishing a really light mono, where the pellet actually, or the, the bait, whatever it is, falls on top of your lead. I don't want that. I want my hook length itself, just as the carp lads would, to actually kick the rig out slightly itself. I mean, this is still a million mile away from as good as it could get, because we don't have the use of 
braids and things like that it's most of the time it's not allowed in our world but by using say really really thick fluorocarbon line for me it definitely just helps create that taut effect so not tight i'm not after that really straight line on the bottom but just that slightly taut effect that means that once the fish takes that hook into its mouth it's in contact with the lead a little bit quicker and say so the length of the hook length also comes into that but that depends on what the fisheries allow you but for me probably what the happy length is sort of anywhere between 12 and six inch i mean it's only extreme circumstances i go any smaller than that if if fisheries allow Lastly, what we're going to go on to is hooks. And what we're going to go with this, it's, it's pin you more than anything. You've seen how important hooks are for getting your bait to work in the right way when it comes to popped up bread. Whenever you're fishing static baits on the bottom, which is pretty much every other bait you're going to use, whether it's maggots, corn, meat, pellet, whatever else. Um, where's it going with this one? Not a clue. Um, the style of hook you use or the size for me, I think I'm on the big is better now. Definitely, I've tried over the years, I've gone through really small to make sure they suck it up a bit easier, all those sorts of things. But these days, I'm on great big lumps of iron to make sure that I give myself the best chance of that hook going in. So we talk about it lots and lots in that when you look at the size of a carp's mouth, or in some cases it's flipping like that, the equivalent of a 20 or an 18 hook going in that, it looks ridiculous. And the gear you're using could easily pull it out. So for me these days, I'm definitely in the, the big is better properties. So I'll often use somewhere between a 12 and a, well, it depends on the size of the hook, but yeah, 12, 10, in some circumstances, a flipping eight if I'm allowed. I mean, I've got no qualms about using great big lumps of iron when I'm using the correct bait that's proportional to the size of hook I'm using. And in turn as well, in the carp anglers type sort of world, I'm a massive, massive big believer in whacking me silicon on. So you can see with all my hooks, I whip all the way down to the bottom of the curve. And then from that point onwards, I have my little piece of silicon that brings it all the way around to create the right sort of angle for my hair rig. It's all about getting that hook bait to turn. So when you have your hook bait, the carp sucks it in, the hook's always going to turn on itself and make sure you get them fish in the bottom of the lip. I mean, again, another carpy sort of thing. Yes, can be done a lot, 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 lot better. But for match fishing, it's almost as good as we can get at the minute with all those properties put together, weight of lead, straight hook lengths, big hooks with kicking off elements. Those things all combined for me, hopefully give me a little bit or stack the odds a lot more in my favour of them fish hooking themselves rather than getting away with it, which is the last thing I want when it's so hard to get a bite in the first place. Right, so on to the good bits after all the technical bits has now been spoken about and the fishing itself, but it's not as easy as it seems to be. I definitely think you need to approach your targeting winter carp in a very methodical manner just as you would if you're dobbing bread i mean very very same principles in that for me i'm not a big fan of jumping on the potential epicenter straight away i think it'll often do more harm than good and when we led fishing exactly the same property so what we got today very very standard sort of lake that will have open water for the majority with an island in front of us so those fish are potentially contained I mean, a bit different today. I've got no one fishing to make the fish move, which definitely, definitely make things a lot better when you've got some lines in the water. But today I haven't had a chuck yet. So what I'm hoping for is that there's some fish already in front of me because it's unlikely they're going to move from other areas today because of no pressure. But still, what I want to do is not go straight to where I think them fish are going to be. I mean, if I've been sat here, maybe a few fish are topping tight to the island or just off the island. Yes, you really, really do want to chuck there straight away to get a quick response. But what I'd much rather prefer, especially in match conditions, is to leave them alone. Yeah, if fish are already in that area, sat waiting, as long as no one else is going to get to them and upset them, all leaving them is going to do is make other fish congregate with them if you leave them alone to be happy. So what I'd much prefer to do is start short. I mean, it's amazed me how many occasions um, I've started short. Like today, we got, what, what are you going to give me, 35 metres to the island? We're liking that. I'm having that, about that, 35 metres. So going past pole range, obviously, if I can fish pole, I'm going to fish pole. But anywhere 16 metres to that 35 metres, it amazes me how many fish I catch at 20 metres. You know I mean, just past that pole line, it's always worth starting there just to see what's going on. I'd say, with, if anything else as well, as I said, to let them accumulate in the sexy bits and then slowly move. I mean, it, 
you can gain a much better understanding of your peg by starting off the fish and moving to them than you can if you go almost to your extreme, get liners, problems happen, and then you have to come back. So it takes a little bit longer to find them that way, plus you massively increase your chances of upsetting the fish by foul looking them, them just being annoyed by the line touching them, they're being an obstacle. You're just annoying fish when you don't need to. So pretty much what I'm trying to say is sneak up to them. And that's definitely what I'm going to do today. I'm going to have a nice, simple cast. I'm probably going to go, what I'm going to go, it's unlikely I'm going to catch any fish close. I'm going to go two thirds today. That's going to be my limit. I've got loads of water there. I can chuck all over the lake. So I'm going to go towards the point, nicely over there. I'm going to go two thirds of the way to the island. And that gives me flipping, what am I going to say? If I said 35 meters, <laughs> no, I'm going to go about five to 10 meters off the island. So it gives me nearly 10 meters to work with. So that gives me a lot of two, two meter intervals. I can keep sneaking up, going towards the island, going left and right. It gives my peg, it ma makes me work my peg in a better way. So I'm not going right through the best bit straight away and potentially upsetting me fish. So that's where I'm going to start. We're all good. We're not clipped up, hopefully. I'm going to wang one. Just nice there. So probably about 10 meters off the island, that one, which is where I want to start. And what I want to do is tighten up nice. So in this case, I've started up on me really popped up one just because there's a little bit of weed on the bottom and it's ridiculously clear, this lake, lovely, lovely clear lake. So what I want to do is pop that bait up, just see if I can get any visual, um, fish swimming past it, visual, sort of visual takes like a zig rig style type thing. So I'm going to start with that. So I'm just tightening up to that first cast of that line's a little bit, a little bit dry. And you can see the angle of the dangle on my rod it's quite extreme. It's not like summertime where I'd have it really pointed at the bait to accentuate them bites even more. So they're, they're sort of self-hooking themselves. I give myself a good angle. So clockwise, when I'm sat up on my box, I'm on like 20 past 10. Do you know what I mean? The buds are 20 past, the tips are about 10 o'clock. That's pretty much perfect for um, reading me tips sort of thing, seeing what's going on, seeing them liners. Cause with this, unlike in the summer, when liners can be a lot more of a problem. Just want to tighten up a little bit more to that. A little bit of slope there. So let me let just bounce back a tiny bit. Yeah, that's nice, beautiful. I'm just going to leave that like that. Um, what was I about? In summer, they can be a nuisance moving my line, uh, moving my rig, just being a pain. In winter, liners tell you everything that's going on. And this rig, because I'm popping my bait up, it can make it happen even more if any fish are brushing past it, just slightly dislodging that ledge, lead. You can see things a lot more. So that's simply how I'm going to start. Do you know what I mean? Wang it in, be nice and patient, see what's going on, but above all else, don't cast too much. Yeah, uh, the number one mistake I see when ledger in for carp is people cast like they're flipping spinning for them. Yeah, don't try and locate them too quick. During a match, especially that first hour, that first hour is massive for it, in that everyone else casting all over the place, regular casting, without doubt makes the carp move, gets them active, gets them whizzing around the lake a little bit. You need to be the one sat there, nice and dormant, leaving them alone, hopefully letting them accumulate in your area. I mean, if there's no features like this lake that's very uniform at every peg, there's no distinctive feature that they're going to sit on, they can really, really easily, is that a little bit of a liner then? Really, really easily be moved around the lake by other anglers. So let that happen. I mean, just as you would if you were dobbing, just sit, let yours be the undisturbed area, both in terms of casting and as well feed. You know I mean, I'll come on to that lastly, is that the introduction of feed, that's well later on in the session just starting off with a, a bomb is the way to go so one's just top there so i'm going to clock that already i've clocked one a yeah, little tree on the far bank one's just been probably the length i'm off probably eight to ten meters off the island lovely little area there one's just top there so i'm going to keep that earmark straight away but potentially my next castle where i think the fish are going to start moving to so seeing the top's brilliant but don't go on them straight away let them accumulate in that area as i keep saying so yeah, I'm going to give this cast now probably what, with us pleasure fishing, I'll probably have to cast a bit more regularly with it just being us. But if it were a match, oh, another little indication then, a bit of a liner then. Uh, in a match, I'd sit it up to half an hour. I mean, if no one's catching, as long as I'm confident that my rig's presenting my bait, as I've shown it, lovely in the edge, it's doing what I want it to do, I am perfectly happy to sit up to half an hour with that lead in the water. As long as no one... Uh, in close proximity to me, he's catching any fish or there's no stupid signs <laughs> like 30 or 40 fish topping in one area we beg. I mean, if I'm happy to sit there, if nothing's happening, don't make something happen. I mean, you're much better and much less likely to mess your peg up 
by sitting and waiting than you are being a bit erratic, chucking all over the place, messing the peg up and annoying them little fish that they may only have a tiny window. So I don't know whether I mentioned it earlier on in that I've seen it loads and loads and loads at different venues up and down the country, often like um, playing ponds. Like we've got at Lingmere, Steve's place, we've got um, ornamental ponds. You see it everywhere you go. Those carp, they're nearly dead. At this time of year, the, the proper carp, five to 15 pound, the big lads, there's such a small amount of them in the lake willing to actually move because most of them are just turned into zombies. They're sat there really, really dormant. Zero chance you're going to catch them anyway. So it may only be a tiny little window during the day, during that five hours, where a few of the fish get mobile anyway. So you don't want to upset the fish that have been dormant that are moving about before you have that little window where they feed. And you do, that'll often be signified by just an increase in a lot more line, there's a bit more activity, seeing things going on. And they can often be the windows where you catch a few fish. So you don't want to do anything to completely clear the fish out of your area before that time arrives with a bit of luck. So right now I'm going to sit here, give it 10 more minutes. And then, because I'm sat on my own, I think it might be worth a, another cast. But we'll see how this one goes. After a long, long way, finally that's gone round. But well, this is my first one on the popped up one. You know, this was vertical zig rig styly that we've had one. Not a great big one, but exactly the sort of thing that we're after on that. Visual, really clear water, standing out. This is, this is a little baby one for in here. But what I feel like I'm doing is exploring the peg with both casting and me rigs. I so say you've got them two elements, you've both got the on the deck if the fish are willing to, to pick it up, but also this attention grabber that's sitting there 12 inches off deck in case they're not, in case they're just swimming past and they're not looking at the bottom. We're having you, yeah baby. This is a lovely little baby one, but very nice. I'll take him, you see where he's hooked as well. Is exactly what I'm on about, about them picking that hook up. It doesn't get any better than that. Do you know what I mean? I'm not losing that fish because of how the hook is and it's kicking back into the fish. It is job done. It doesn't get no better than that. There is no way in the world that fish is ever coming off unless I try to flip and swing it. So we just need one next. About six times bigger with a bit of luck. Look at a lovely little start, that one. So again, this one was in the first place that we chucked and eventually it's gone. It was a bit of a wait. It's a proper one, this. This is a big lab. This is exactly the sort of thing that we're fishing for. I reckon this is the only way, no feed, single hook bait type thing, that I'm going to catch these big ones on this style of really clear venue. I mean, I was going to go into feeding later, but of course you've got the options of flat method feeders and method feeders or pellet feeders, whatever else, if you need to introduce a bit of bait. But today, all focused on a bomb. That is what I want to talk about. And the next step is introducing a bit of bait that I'll go into, but obviously if I can get away with it, you don't need that many bites. If I'm playing a 10 pound fish potentially, then I need what, six or seven bites in a day for very likelihood of winning some cash. So if you can get the six or seven bites on this, then there's going to be no need at all what to feed. This is a big lad, this as well. Hopefully he's nice and in the mouth, just as we were showing you with the last one. But we'll see, so I'm taking my time. Everything's nice, everything's nice and strong. We've got a great big thick 020 hook length on, so there's no chance of that going. Take me time with everything, don't try and drag them in. With a bit of luck, I'm gonna have a big pretty 10 pounder in my net. A bit smaller, 9, 12, I'm feeling that. That's how big this one's gonna be. Not quite 10. Go 
two of us. No, don't do that. Don't do that. So it's proper nice as well using little light bomb rods as well. Just you don't need that poke because you never throw in the big heavy feeders ever. It's so much nicer using the softer bomb style rods. So these are just 10 foot ones that are, they absorb everything and make there so much less chance. Cue the fish falling off, of the fish falling off. Here is he. So the water's lovely and clear here. So once he's like a foot or so, oh look at him! Oh, he's a pretty one. I like that. Wow, oh, yeah, boy. He's a proper one, and hopefully hooked. Oh, he's not. He's not even nine. He's eight pound two. Not quite, but he'll do. That's a much better example. He's not even that. He's seven pound. See where he's hooked. So I don't want to. I don't want to drag him out. But if we get camera in there. Beautifully, you see, it don't get better than that. Do you know what I mean? There's absolutely no way in the world that that hook's going to pull out just because it's all done right, all hooked exactly where we want it. I can't even get it out myself. Beautiful. You know what I mean? Perfect job. Never going to lose him. Making sure every single opportunity I get ends up in that net. That is what this is all about. Let me get rid of him and chuck him in. Lovely. Right, so we're getting really lucky and I've caught a couple of fish on bread, which I mean today I'm more than happy to get a bite with how cold it is. And if I'm honest, I think bread's definitely the way to go. If I was to continue fishing, sit there, be nice and patient, I'd probably get a few more pulls. But I need to talk about what could happen. And of course, there's the element in potentially needing to introduce a little bit of bait just to, to focus the fish in. And yes, of course, you've got options of putting whatever type of feeder you want to put on, as I mentioned, but that's a whole new video in itself. Yeah, if I just want to fish a lead, and I want to fish different baits. That's the main emphasis. Obviously, if I don't want micro pellets, ground bait, whatever else to be involved, and I want to fish different baits, then definitely incorporating funny ways of feeding definitely, definitely are an advantage when it comes to legending. And something, again, massively underused in the match fishing world is using PVA. I mean, little PVA bags of whatever you decide to choose on your hook, be it little cubes of meat, a little bit of corn, whatever. It's the only way of introducing bait that accurately literally there's no other way other than a method feeder pellet feeder whatever of introducing such a condensed amount of bait and with baits like corn or in today's case maggots it's the only way of creating that presentation out there at distance keeping things what we're we going to say trap form i mean just so we're done a pole if i was just fishing in the edge when i want to set a trap of a tight compact area of bait the only way i can do it out there as i say with a lead is by introducing a little bit of PVA. And that's gonna be the nice little sneaky tip just to sort of wrap the video up, is that what I've done, I've whizzed over to a different hook length, exactly the same components, all in the hook length, but on that one, I budged a bit of a, bit of a spider of maggots going on, bit of a budge job, definitely room for improvements on that one, but pretty much what I want is their maggots on the hook, nice visible thing. And what I'm gonna do in this case is impale a nice little tiny Oh, I need to make sure I don't hook a maggot when I'm doing this. That's uh, tip number one, is impale a little tiny PVA bag on it. Yeah, and I want to be quick on that because the maggots have leaked on it. I'm going to re-hook that. So I think that's going to rip off because I hooked a maggot. Yeah, get that on nice and quick. Get that into the peg. And what it's going to do is create with dead maggots. So definitely dead maggots is what I'm after. So they stay in that lovely, lovely condensed area. I'm going to chuck this. I'm going to go that way this time. Am I? No, I'm going to go that way. And what that'll create is that lovely, lovely, tight, condensed area of dead maggots that aren't going to crawl away. I mean, if I wanted live maggots all over the peg, maggot feed is going to be the way to go. But with dead maggots, I can keep a lovely, perfect trap set with my little spider's web of maggots sat right on top of it beautifully. And just give them something a bit more to home in on. I mean, if they want something to eat, I've got the option of introducing things in the most perfect and accurate way I possibly could with the use of PVA. So it's something that's well worth a go. And say so in this case, it's maggots. If I was fishing corn, it might be a little tiny bag with five or six pieces of corn in. So you have to be careful with the, the water elements, of course, so it doesn't disappear. But definitely something as match anglers that we need to bring into our fishing just to improve as carp ledgers. I mean, as I've said many, many times during this video, it is without doubt for me 
the one area of match vision that needs improving. We're really bad at it. Whether you agree or not, it's the way it is. Do you know what I mean? But if anyone's got any nice little sneaky topics they'd like to mention, like, sneaky topics of improvement they'd like to mention on bomb fishing, definitely whack them in the comments because I could not appreciate any more help on this subject without a doubt. It's something for me, I want to improve on myself to get as good as possible just to make sure I don't miss them out. So hopefully you enjoyed that. Hopefully I can catch one more and then it's time to go and get warm because it's flipping freezing.